So the, I'm thinking big now. The earth is the same size as it used to be when humankind was living here for many thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and when the American way of life did not exist. That's, what is the American way of life? This is a picture <clears throat> representing it in a certain way 60 years ago in the Midwest of the USA. This is a family of four with their shopping, shopping cart. And this is the food they would have in one year. These are the, the beef hocks hanging here, yes? And this is the, uh, the hams here. Yeah. And here are the chickens. Yes? Chicken every week, beef ham every week, meat every night, yes? Um, these are the vegetables, the cabbages, the uh, brinjals here, the uh, celery, the lettuce, the cauliflower, the string beans, all this kind of stuff. These are the potatoes. Well, going on out here, it doesn't stop here. This is the milk. Yes. This is for four people, yes? This is the butter. Yes. Uh, this is, uh, oh, I forget what this is, but something like that. This is the fruits, yes, the apples, <clears throat> the oranges, yeah, these are the nuts. This is the cornflakes and the Wheaties, American inventions, yes, cornflakes, packaged food coming in. We, we eat much more packaged food now than we used to back in the 1950s, yes. This is the bread that would be used to make cakes, and these are the eggs and so on. That's the American way of life, yeah. That's why half of you have relatives in the USA, yes? That didn't exist for a long time. Go next. This fact that the Earth is the same size, but the American way of life didn't exist, and now it's the same size, and it does. Is this a problem? That's the question I'm asking, one of the questions. Well, how would we estimate quantitatively the overall environmental impact of humankind's economic activities. So I'm going to go through some of this as an exercise. I hope you will feel that it is kind of fun. I will give you some numbers, but they won't be too complicated. This will be like a high school, uh, you know, secondary school economics lesson. I hope you will enjoy it. Let's go. So we have an equation. Uh, see, I'm an economist, so we have to have an equation, right? I equals P times T times C times T, where I represents environmental impact of humankind, the whole thing, all of humankind, all of the earth. P represents the size of the human population, how many people there are. C represents the per capita consumption rate. That's what we were talking about when we talked about the American way of life a moment ago. Yeah. And T represents the levels of environmental damage under current economic techniques. So. Uh, it might be that some techniques cause more damage than other techniques in order to give the same per capita consumption. You know, people used to ride on horses, now they ride in cars. Which technique causes more damage to the environment? Could we invent techniques that cause less damage and so on? So that's a, that's a tricky factor, hard to evaluate quantitatively uh, in a way. It's easy to evaluate population, which we'll do in a minute. Now, is the impact really becoming very dangerous to us, humankind, that's the question, yes? Let's start by looking at P, historically, the population. For hundreds of thousands of years, it was something like one thousandth as much as it is now, yes? These are estimates from four standard books on the, standard sources on the subject. These are books, and this is a, uh, a source that is always on the net. And this is 10,000 years ago, 8,000, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000. So that's before the real rise of civilization. We're just on the edge, a very ancient civilization. And these people have different estimates. But these estimates are around 7 million, which is one one-thousandth of what we have now. We have 7,000 million now. Yes? Excuse me. Uh, uh, uh. 
Yes, 7,000 million now. And um, so there's some leeway, but the order of magnitude is one one thousandth. That's quite a difference going on. So here it is graphically. This graph starts 12,000 years ago, which is about the time that agriculture came in. This is this one one thousandth. This is our 7,000 million we have today. We're above it now. This thing was made a year ago, so it should be a little higher here. And this is about 6,000 years ago. And here comes civilization. This is 2,000 years ago. Hmm? So now we're getting into ancient, you know, cities and agriculture. They go together, cities and agriculture. This is 1,000 years ago. Here's the Black Death, which took away one-third of the population of, the, of Europe. Yes? Here's... 1,800, 1 billion, 1,000 million, yes? This is 1925, 2,000 million, and here we are now. So that's really quite a, quite a change. If you know that the future will be very different from the past, and if you are uncertain as to how the differences will affect what you are concerned about, then you cannot reckon the future risks. Because when you reckon the future on the basis of the past, you have to have some belief that it's going to be the same way. That's the way insurance companies can set their premiums. You understand. If you know it's going to be very different, you don't have risk assessment. You have uncertainty. And that is part of our problem. Next. Now, I might just mention that the geographical distribution of the population is very uneven. And this is very easy to reckon, too. You measure the human population on the land, not counting the water. And that's easy to do for nations, because we have census. And you divide by the land area, and that gives you a number called the human population density. Now, 10,000 years ago, if the population was about 5 million, and the size of the land and the earth 10,000 years ago was about the same as it is today, then there was about one person for every 250 square kilometers. That was a long time ago. In Australia today, land area population, it's about three people per square kilometer, on average, in Australia. In the USA today, 32. In India today, 368. This is not even distribution. Yes. And, of course, it's very uneven within India, right, in some parts of Rajasthan, and so on. But... The growth rate of the population is predicted to taper off. It doesn't seem to be in store that it's going to keep on expanding. At least that is the hope. Now, here are charts for India in particular. In 19, and these are census figures, 51, 61, 71, 81, 91, every 10 years in India. And so it was less than 400,000 um, uh, 4, million then, and it increased to... Uh, more than 12,000 million as of uh, 2011. Now it's up to about here, yes? And this is, so these are the numbers. So you see it here doubling every 35 years or so because the expansion rate here was about 2% per year. 2% per year means doubling every 35 years. It means it's like compound interest. It's not simple interest rate. And <clears throat> however, the rate of increase has been coming down from 2% in 1991 to one and a half percent in 2011, largely because the girls have been going to school. And if that goes on, and there's every reason to believe more and more of the girls will go to school, it could be it'll keep coming down. And these are predictions put out by the United Nations, and they estimate that the Indian population will peak at about 17,000 million. <clears throat> and around that time, the number of children per marriage on average, will be about two, so the population won't be growing after that. And in fact, the number may decline a little. So this is, this they say this increase can't go on forever, and they're estimating that it won't go on forever. That's just for India. Of course, we could do this for the whole world, and it will take too long. We go on. So much for P. Now, estimating how much of, how much per capita consumption is a little more difficult. It's very hard to reckon, because I'm not just talking money, I'm talking different goods that the earth produces, yes? But you can get an estimate. It has been done. There are economists who have tried to make this estimate. They try to reckon gross world product. You know about gross domestic product, gross national product. 
that's what's in there. Well, there's a gross world product that can be estimated. And this is uh, from a standard book on this subject, estimating how that has grown historically in regard to population, in other words, what the per capita differences have been, hinting at how much the per capita consumption has grown. Now, when you measure consumption in terms of money, it's a little tricky because consumption, you're paying money for services as well as goods, you understand? But that was always the case. It was always the case in the past that a lot of the money that was spent was spent on services and not just on goods. People used to have a lot of servants in the past if they could afford it, yes? So it gives a good hint. And here we go. Next. So here's the world population 1,000 years ago, 270, 67 million. And these dollars have been have been have filtered through to be the equivalent of 1990 billions of dollars, okay? So these are equivalent measure, this is equivalent measure, and the point is here that this number is more than twice this number. This number is nearly twice this number. This number is only 50% bigger than this number. This number is smaller than this number. So the per capita consumption is increasing, you see. Huh? And this number is only is less than half this number, and this is 1950, that's when the picture was taken in the USA, but this is worldwide, not USA. And now, between 1950 and 2003, the per capita consumption is about eight times per capita, eight times more than it was in 1950. This is, capitalism has done both things for the world. It has helped the population expand tremendously. That big shot uh, mounting of the population, that was due to capitalism. And this big increase in per capita consumption is also due to capitalism. Here, we're talking 1820, when it's just getting off the ground, 1913, 1950. This is, this is so the, the increase in consumption is also very notable. Yeah? Remarkable. We're going on. Now, it's very hard to measure the technology of the, the environmental impact of technologies globally, but there are attempts to do it. And I'll give you now two charts that give some numbers for combining the two together. These are both based on an estimate of per capita times prevailing techniques. And let's go. The first is something called ecological footprint in hectares. Now, <clears throat> your ecological footprint is the area of the Earth, the, the quantitative, how much area you need for your various needs. What are your needs? Well, you have dairy products, curd, milk, whatever you take, gur, and that has to be come from cows, and the cows need pasture. How much pasture is needed to supply a nation with the, the dairy products that are consumed in that nation? We have the figures for the dairy products. They're in the national, you know, the dairy industry keeps tabs. So we know per nation how much dairy how much meat, how much wheat, how much this, how much that. So from this, for each nation, you can calculate which different kinds of land area, how much of which different kinds of land area are needed to provide it. Now, that land doesn't have to be in the same nation. It can be somewhere else, you understand. This is about consumption. And also, in the uh, ecological footprint reckoning, is a reckoning of surface that you need to throw the stuff away. Yes? Uh, the landfills, the, the, the lakes where you throw the water and so on, all that is put in with prevailing techniques, with the techniques that are actually being used at this time. And so this exercise was done. Uh, uh, th this whole idea came up about uh, um, 20 years ago. And 10 years ago, a big article was published with estimates for uh, 60 or 70 different countries. You can get it for each country because for each country you have the market information. And then you divide the country's ecological footprint by the number for the population, and you get a per capita estimate for each country. You see, average per capita. This doesn't tell you about the differences within the country between the people who are consuming more and less, but it tells you the differences between this country that country. And the USA had the biggest. This is hectares, total hectares. Now, this hectares is all the different, different kinds, all put into one figure. So that's not informative for ecology, but it gives us an idea of 
the level of consumption times the techniques. And the USA was 10 hectares. In, uh, and USA has about 7 hectares per person available within the USA. And so the USA was importing 3.5 per person. This was 10 years ago. Australia had a very high figure, but Australia is so sparsely populated that she has a positive balance in terms of ecological footprint. And China was very low then, uh, and because her population density isn't that high, uh, 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 still she had a negative balance. India had very low per capita ecological footprint 10 years ago, and, uh, but because it's so densely populated, she still had a slightly negative figure. Now, today, these figures for China and India would be rather higher. Yes? Uh, let's go on to another. So um, this, this gives you some idea. And this is why people in India say, why should we take less? It's up to the Americans to take less. You understand? It's just not fair to ask us to take less. We've gone from maybe less than a hectare to two hectares, right? But the Americans are still consuming much more. Let them cut down first. Then we can begin to think about it later on. That's the argument I hear all the time in India. And there's a lot of, it's a logical argument. But there is something, it's a perfectly logical argument. I'll say more later. Next measure. This is carbon footprint. Now, this is not area. This is tons. You could do carbon in tons or something else. But tons is best because it doesn't matter whether the carbon is gas or what form it's in. Again, the same thing. You do the nation, then you divide by the population you get per capita. So in Australia, each person is using up about 10, uh, 70, emitting about 17 tons of carbon per year, in the form of carbon dioxide mainly, into the atmosphere. Yes? But, and it got worse. And so now I have two, two figures because the World Bank is tracking this. The World Bank is very concerned about global warming. And so they're tracking this for each nation, for each year. So I picked out seven nations, the same seven I had in the other, plus two years, 95 and 2008, which was as much the most recent I had. So in Australia, it got worse between those two times, yes? In Canada, it got a little worse, yeah? In China, between 95 and 2008, it got considerably worse. You see, it nearly doubled. Today, it would be well over that double rate. Actually, the total carbon footprint for China today is equal to the total carbon footprint for the USA today. Well, China has four times as many people. So it's still only one-fourth per capita, but it's growing at a very fast rate in China. And you know they have this terrible air pollution in China because of, because of this. Yeah? Uh, Germany has cut down because there's the Green Party and this and that. But actually, in the last year, the German figure has gone up because they closed down some of the nuclear plants, and Germany burnt more coal last year than she did the year before. So in Germany, right at the moment, it's a little dodgy that way. Japan has rather high, and the USA twice as much, yes? USA twice as much. So this is carbon footprint. You can get this very easily from the World Bank. You get much more data than you want, but I just took out these, 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 this amount. So we go on. So this gives some idea of per capita consumption. It's a lot. Now I want to, next slide please, have a slight digression because this matter of global warming, which is due largely to carbon dioxide, is a particular kind of environmental impact that we are very worried about today. Yes? We believe that the carbon footprint is having an effect on the weather because of global warming. And I'm going to first here in this little digression about impact. I'm going directly over to impact now, you see, for a bit. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about monsoons in central India. This next uh, two or three slides are from a paper I heard given by the most eminent and expert Indian meteorologist, a man named Goswami, who works in Pune for the Indian government. And I heard a paper by him uh, uh, a month and a half ago. So we go on here. Oh, first, we'll get to him in a minute. First is this uh, carbon dioxide emission for the world. How many parts per million? It's only a tiny part of the atmosphere. About 80% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. Nearly 20% is, is oxygen. In that remaining 1% includes some carbon dioxide. And as the carbon dioxide becomes more and more within that 1%, it 
causes a greenhouse effect. You've all read about it. You know what it is. <clears throat> and it used to be, back in the 1950s, about three parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And now it's more than four, uh, 400 parts. It used to be 300 parts per million. Now it's more than 400 parts per million as of this year. This chart is a year or two old. So it's gone up 25% in 50 years. Now, what is the consequence of this? This is temperature, surface temperature of the Earth. It's very hard to measure. It's a very abs absurd abstraction to say, what's the temperature of the Earth? You understand, there's so many differences. And differences from one year to the next, and day and night, and everything. But they, they do their best, and these are the uncertainty measures, these things. And these are the data they have. And this is a smoothing out by taking only the 10-year average, showing how the 10-year. And the point is that it goes up and down, but basically, it's going from this part of the chart to that part of the chart. It's going up. There is global warming taking place since 1880, a lot of it, and most notably since 1980. That's really quite something. Yeah. So it's getting warmer. Yeah. That's the atmosphere and the surface of the Earth. That includes the oceans, the atmosphere. That's where the temperature is changing. It's not changing in the middle of the Earth. It's very hot in the middle of the Earth, always was. Now, this is data from this meteorologist. And it's specifically about the monsoons in central India. And this is about days in the monsoon season during which more than 150 millimeters of rain fell. You know, you put a tube in, uh, a cylinder, and you measure how much rain fell in the day. Yes? Now, 150 millimeters is a lot. 150 millimeters is soaking the ground Yes? It's not really what you want for agriculture. It's, it's extreme. You understand? It's a, it's, a, it's a soaking day. And it used to be that on average, it goes up and down year after year, good, this kind of monsoon, that kind of monsoon. But it, back in the 1950s and 40s, the average was around 10 days, less than 10 days per year, average. And now it's up to nearly 20 days per year of these heavy days. Yeah? Very heavy days. Defined. And the next chart. So this is a broader category of more than 100. So this is two thirds as much. That's still heavy. And it used to be that there were less than 50 days with more than 100 in a monsoon in central India on average. And now it's up to more than 60. And these are the moderate days. These are the days the crops really like between 5 and 100. And there used to be more than 100 days of the monsoon were like that. And now that's gone down slightly. So there are a lot. Fewer days of really nice monsoon, and a lot more days of monsoon that's more than you want, more than the crops really want. And he concludes from this, frequency of occurrence, as well as intensity of heavy and very heavy rainfall events, have highly significant increasing trends over central India. Low and modern events have significantly decreasing trend over India, just a slight decrease on average. Yes? The seasonal mean, the total, does not have a trend because decreasing contribution from the low and moderate events are compensated by increasing contribution from the heavy events. So the, on average, the total rainfall in the monsoons isn't changing that much. And that's a bit of a puzzle. He doesn't understand why. They don't understand why it's the case that this. But the conclusion is there are more extreme ones. And his implication, the trend of extreme events indicates that rain-related disasters are going to increase. Now, this was a part of a very elaborate lecture where he also, with lots of statistics, lots more than you want, showed that it is twice as difficult today as it was in the 1970s to predict what the monsoon is going to be like. Because with all these extreme events one way and the other, you, the, the data from the past is you're in that uncertainty trap that I talked about at the beginning. You know the future is going to be different from the past with more extreme events, more bad monsoons one way and the other. You can't predict as well. So he's very worried about this. Now, just today, you may have read in the papers about the flooding in England. Yes. And Nicholas Stern, who's just, uh, you can't get more prominent as an economist in England than Lord Stern. And he gave an interview to The Guardian today. I put this in just an hour ago. Annual greenhouse gas emissions have increased steeply in the last seven years since he wrote the famous Stern Report. 
And some of the impacts, such as the decline of Arctic sea ice, have started to happen much more quickly than we expected before, seven years ago. He's put this interview in because of the horrible flooding they're having now in England. It's time to speak up. We also underestimated the potential importance of strong feedbacks. Now, let me not go into that, but you understand intuitively what I mean. Such that the thawing of the permafrost to release, such as the thawing to release methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. A little bit of methane is as much greenhouse effect as a lot of carbon dioxide. Methane is even worse. <clears throat> in the climate, so changes in the climate, yes, tipping points, beyond which some changes in the climate may become effectively irreversible, are likely to be occurring. So he's very worried about this, yes? He ought to be worried, I assume, yes? So that's the end of my digression about the effect of the carbon dioxide and the methane on the weather uh, through the greenhouse effect. Now, <clears throat> that's not the only kind of impact on the, on the economy. This I is our total impact, yes? There are some other kinds of environmental degradation besides climate change ruining the weather. Now I'm going to get away from the numbers. We've had enough numbers. <laughs> we, we can get a little descriptive here. Let's go. Next slide. Ah, yes. Now, depletion of non-renewable mineral sources, the oil, the coal, the natural gas, these are buckets. There's only so much in the earth. They're not going to renew themselves. It's not like a river or a forest, yes? And <clears throat> I don't want to go into the why these curves look like this, but this is the concept of peak oil. This is the rate of production, and the area under each curve is the total bucket, estimate of the total size of the bucket. Now, <clears throat> oil, and this estimate was made in 2010 by as a doctoral thesis in, in Spain. And at that time, the prediction was that oil would peak in 2008. Now, if this estimate is 100% under for the size of the bucket, if the bucket is really twice as big, that pushes the peak 35 years further into the future. Not very far. Not very far. Natural gas, 2023. Coal, 2060. These, once they're gone, they're smoke and ashes. There's no way you can recycle that stuff. A lot of this stuff, iron, aluminum, copper, and a lot of other minerals, can be recycled, provided you spend something to, for the energy to get them back, right? One reason German cars, automobiles, cost so much is that 80% of the steel in German automobiles has been recycled, <laughs> whereas in the U.S. it's only 50% or something like that. So anyway, <clears throat> but the point is that all this stuff is going to wind down. You don't have to get to the very bottom of the bucket to have a problem. You have to be only on the really far on the way down to have, you know, big social, economic, and human problems. And there are going to be big problems by the end of this century. Yes. So that's, but it hasn't happened yet. Go back. Not yet much impact. Uh, we're a little worried about the price of petroleum going up and so on, but it's not a catastrophe yet. It's just a, a worry about how much you're paying, right? But more impact seems to be in store for our children and grandchildren if there's any sense to these curves. And I could go on to the history of these curves and why everybody believes in them. The oil industry believes in the government. We go on. Now, renewable natural resources being used up faster than they can renew themselves. The model example is big rivers that don't even get to the ocean any longer. There are two great big rivers in China that don't even get to the ocean now. And forests being cut down, you name it, there's a lot of it. Pollution is another kind of environmental debris. Pollution is like a sink getting overloaded. There's always mercury in the sea. It's pollution. It's in the sea. But it's not enough to poison the fish so much that we don't want to eat the fish. But when it gets to be too much, then we can't eat the fish. That's a, an overloaded sink, you see. And so there are all kinds of pollution you read about from time to time. Yeah? I'm not going to give any numbers for this. Yes? Super bacteria. Yeah, the doctors are really worried about this. You know the whole story of super, about super bacteria. Yes? And more virulent viruses, the dengue. You name it, there's a story every week about worry about some kind of bird flu, this, that, some kind of virus. Are we going to have the medicines to cope with these things? This is a big, well, we might. It's conceivable. You understand? I'm not giving the answer uh, uh, because I'm not that arrogant. Uh, okay. 
Extinctions of too many biological species. This is the one that keeps me up at night. Go ahead. Next. The geologists have made an estimate of the average rate of extinction. There are always some species going extinct. That's the nature of life. Yeah. People die, species die out. That's happening. There's an estimate of the average rate that it was happening for many hundreds of millions of years. And that's based on the fossils, fossil records. And then there's another way of estimating what percent of the total number of species on the Earth today are about to go extinct now, per year, are going to be extinct per year now. And the rate is something between 100,000 times as much as the average. Now, what does that mean? So here is what a, and these are, these are broad extractions. Here's what a first-rate ecologist, Peter F. Sale, has to say about this. I got these figures from the, his book, but you can get them elsewhere. By the end of this century, most of the larger species, coyote size and up, the majority of the larger species, other than those which we're directly cultivating, like the cows and the dogs, yeah, are likely to be extinct or to exist only as threatened populations. By the end of this century, he says, likely to be. This is not risk assessment insurance company-wise. This is estimating about something that is uncertain. Environmental goods and services, which are needed by humanity, will be much reduced simply because of the loss of diversity of organisms. With the increased homogeneity and overall reduced diversity, next, there will be much greater risk of pandemics that severely impact particular species and create massive change in ecosystem composition as a result. It's all such a complex way where there's a lot of redundancy in the, in the, in the environment for our services. Yes, we have so many different kinds of nuts, so many different kinds of vegetables, so many different kinds of bees, so many different kinds of rice. But if we got down to only a few kinds, then the loss of even one or two of those kinds could have a real impact, you see, if we lose the redundancy. That's the point. The risk of a species extinction that has major ramifications through the ecosystem will become ever greater as diversity falls and our own population, the human one, will be precariously dependent on just a few species to sustain its vast size, he's predicting by the end of the century. Probably it could be a sustainable world for a time as long as we engaged in a fair amount of environmental engineering, you know, eating seaweed or whatever, to help it along until it neared the point of final collapse. That's really scary. Now, there was a great experiment. You know about this in Arizona, the biosphere? The biosphere, 20 years ago, they built at the University of Arizona this glass, vast glass house so they could make it airtight. It let in the energy from the sun, but not in any material. And they put inside it a whole environment. Next slide. An entire environment with Oceans and, and, and crops and animals, chickens and pigs, uh, they, they, but the whole thing. But it wasn't, wasn't very redundant because there wasn't, you know, you couldn't have a million spike species. There were only a thousand species in there, you see? And they planned it all very carefully and they had a team of people, about ten people, who were very highly trained. And the idea was they were going to live in there <laughs> and make it work. Okay, so here's what happened. Within six months, the highly trained biospherians had lost a lot of weight, and less than a year after those six months, so that's a year and a half into it, the oxygen level had declined by a third. So the oxygen was down to 14% instead of 20% of the air inside there. And the humans had breathing difficulties, and they were getting lethargic. So to keep the experiment going, they, 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 they cheated on the oxygen. They injected oxygen and opened the airlocks every day so they could keep it going. But meanwhile, the chickens weren't producing enough eggs. That, that's what this, part of what they had to eat. And they and the pigs were <laughs> eating up too much of the crops that the humans were supposed to eat. Yeah. So the people slaughtered those animals. They were eating their food, yes. And they started to eat the seeds which had been provided for sowing crops. 
And then they got very antagonistic toward one another, and they closed down the experiment after two years. So this is, this is funny, but it's, but it's alarming. You understand, we need redundancy. Uh, we can't really do it. Uh, we need a certain amount of redundancy. Now, that's enough about this environmental impact. You've got the picture. It's, it's something to worry about. Now, in the history of economic thought, I thought it would be worthwhile to call to your attention two metaphors that were used by economists in the 1960s. One was the economy of a society is like a soaring airplane taking off. You see? That's what the U.S. is going to help the whole world do after the Second World War. With Truman's point four plan and Nehru's tryst with dynasty. They were going to take off to affluence. You understand? They didn't say anything about landing. You see? And the other was the world economy being like a spaceship, the whole Earth, that needs to be provisioned like a ship. When a ship sails, there's no, you can't grow crops on a ship, so you have to put in the food and the stuff the ship's going to need. Can both of these metaphors be correct? Is one of them correct? Now, let me give you the text. They're really interesting. This was one back. Walt Rostow. 1960s, the ages of economic development, an anti a non-communist manifesto, a very influential book in the United States. Walt Rostow became the head, the head of the policy planning council of the American Foreign Ministry of the State Department. Five stages of economic growth with a takeoff. And here's what he wrote in his introductory chapter. It is possible to identify all societies in their economic dimensions as lying within one of five categories, the traditional society, the preconditions for the takeoff, the takeoff, that's where the, India was still in the preconditions phase or takeoff phase, the drive to maturity, and the age of high mass consumption. That's the airplane store flying at a high altitude. That's his metaphor. And meanwhile, six years later, a very prominent economist, more prominent as an economist than Walt Rostow, Kenneth Boulding. He had been president of the American Economic Association, president of the uh, two or three other similarly prestigious. And he published an article called The Economics of the Coming Spaceship Earth. Because, of course, we were, this was the Sputnik, and this is the new metaphor. Yeah. And you could see the Earth from back. Look back and see it. See it as a thing floating out there in the sky. Primitive men, this is an American, and to a large extent also men of the early civilizations, that's those hunters and gatherers I talked about thousands of years ago, imagined themselves to be living on a virtually illimitable plane. There was almost always somewhere beyond the known limits of human habitation, some place else to go when things got too difficult, either by reason of the deterioration of the natural environment or a deterioration of the social structure in places where people happen to live. That's why a lot of people migrated to North America. Yes, the Catholics went to Maryland, the Puritans went to someplace else, and so on. The, the uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment, from um, Iran, from Persia. The Parsis came to India for social reasons. Yeah. The closed earth of the future requires economic policies which are somewhat different from those of the open earth of the past. I am tempted to call the open economy the cowboy economy. The cowboy being symbolic of the illimitable plains. You've all seen the movies. They ride across the plains, right? The good guys chase the bad guys, and then the good guys at the end, they don't get married because they have to make another movie later. And they ride, <laughs> and they ride off without family into the distance, the Lone Ranger and Tonto. Yes, okay. And also, the cowboys associated with reckless, exploited, romantic, and violent behavior, which is a characteristic of these open societies. Why worry? We can chop it down, burn it up, so on. The closed economy of the future might similarly be called the spaceman economy, in which the Earth has become a single spaceship without unlimited resources of anything, either for extraction or for pollution, and in which, therefore, man must find his place in a cyclical ecological system. Whatever he throws away will somehow be transformed into something he can use, which is capable of continuous reproduction of material form, 
even though it cannot escape having inputs of energy. Well, we're getting plenty of energy from the sun. That's not the basic problem. The basic problem is materials. If we could really harness social energy in another way, so, uh, so, uh, solar energy in another way, uh, we wouldn't have a problem. The difference between the two types of economy becomes most apparent in the attitude towards consumption. That's the second letter in my equation, P times C times uh, T. Yes? Towards consumption. In the cowboy economy, consumption is regarded as a good thing by itself, and production likewise. That is the attitude embodied in the drive for a higher gross domestic product. That's what it's all about. More consumption, more production. So there it is. Now, <clears throat> I've presented to you these two visions. I know which one I think is valid, but I don't want to insist. I don't want you to believe me from what I say. I want you to consider facts of this kind and other facts and make up your own mind. That's my mind. Now, here is how the ecological issue that I've been talking about fits into a broader context of three basic kinds of ethical concern in regard to economics. Some people are interested in economics just because they want to make money. Other people are interested in economics as if they were in the government, and they're worried about you know, the whole society, and they have ethical concerns. The businessmen might have ethical concerns too, but it's not why they go to business school. Okay, here we go. There is a trilemma. You have three things you need. You need enough material wealth being produced. And maybe you need more. Maybe you don't need more, maybe you do. You want a big pie. Yeah. Then you want it cut up into pieces and distributed fairly. You don't want a situation where you're going to have, you know, a lot of people starving to death or terrible unrest because of the unfairness. That's what's happening in the Arab Spring, isn't it? Yeah. So that's a different matter than how big. This is how big the pie is. This is how it's distributed. Is it fair enough? Yeah. And you need sustainability. These are three completely different ethical concerns. It's easy to think of two of them. Amartya Sen does this and this. The economists do this and the, the, the Gandhians do this and this. They say we need sustainability. The first Gandhian treatise was called Economy of Permanence. And they're interested in welfare, fairness, yes. But they never say we need more, <laughs> the Gandhians, yes. And then there are some of the, the head of Coca-Cola, Today is worried about ecology. <laughs> Did you read last week? Yes. And of course, they want a bigger market to, to sell to the same, so on. So it's easy to be, but what separates the boys from the men is the men have to think about all three. The adults have to think about all three. So this concern that I've been talking about has to be related to these other concerns. How much do we need a bigger pie? How much do we need to work on distribution? Now, I want to say a little something about distribution because it is a very important concern. Next slide. This is from a wonderful book called The Spirit, um, the Spirit Factor. And uh, this book has uh, 50 charts of this kind. This is a chart involving only affluent countries, with Portugal the least affluent of the batch. Yes? Japan, Norway, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Canada, the USA up here. Yes? And this is income inequality from low to high. You can get that from the tax forms. You get an estimate of how much you know, people are earning here and there. And this is an index prepared by sociologists of how grave the health and social problems are. Yeah? And in the country with the least income inequality, they have the least problems. You see, the whole point is that this thing is going up like this. It's not going like this. Yes. You see, too much inequality is social poison in the modern world. We're not talking about ancient Egypt. <laughs> We're talking about the modern world where everybody has access pretty soon to the media. They all know how the others are getting on. You understand. Too much inequality. Look at this. Yes? These are the Scandinavian countries. Yes? This is Germany, France. Here is Greece. Yes? Italy. Yeah? Portugal and the USA. So, so Inequality is a, is, 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 a, is a very, I haven't been talking about it today, but I wanted to include some attention to this. There are 50 sites. Now, here's some good news, interesting good news. I don't want to leave just with all this, 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 this. I want you to be frightened. I believe we cannot solve these problems with love alone. I think we need fear. We need fear as well. In the great religions, the great... Uh, uh, theological religions, you love God and you fear God. 
Yes, we need fear, I believe, in addition to wealth. Now, here are some top-rate market economists who are now developing a new quantitative measure of wealth. And they're applying it to India. It's going to be in the 12th five-year plan. Let me read it. Here he is, Partha Dasgupta. His father was a great economist, the best Indian economist of his generation. And here is the son, Sir Partha, got an honorary doctor from Harvard this year. And here's his definition of wealth. By wealth, I don't mean income. By wealth, I mean the social worth of... He's talking about the whole wealth of the whole nation now. The social worth of an economy's stock of capital assets. Not the income, the wealth. Stock of capital assets. Comprising manufactured capital. That's roads, ports, machinery, and so on. That's what the capitalist is building. Human capital, which is the people. Their human capital. And the composition. And their education. And their health. The more healthy they are, the more of a resource they are, from an economic point of view. And knowledge, technology, the arts, humanities, humanities and sciences, and the fourth factor, natural capital. The ecosystems, the sources of water, the atmosphere, the land, the subsoil resources, these things I've been talking about earlier that are now in danger. Wealth is thus the measure of an economy's totality of assets of all four kinds. He's putting them all under a single number at the end. I think this is a little dodgy, but but it but it's useful. <clears throat> you need this kind of assessment if you're going to settle a lawsuit or if you're going to have government planning. How much should the government spend on keeping forests as opposed to how much they spend on schools or highways or policemen? How can you allocate? Well, you 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 have to include natural capital as part of the concern that the government's going to have. So wealth per head, adjusted for the distribution of wealth, tracks well-being across the generations exactly. Now, let's see what he found. He worked with Kenneth Arrow, a great welfare economist, and and a team, and they did a, a paper in 2010 with a very tentative estimate in regard to India that during that patch of years, 1995 to 2000, Wealth per head in India increased at an average annual rate of less than one-fifth of one percent per year. Which is a far cry from the GDP increase, which was eight, nine percent per year during that time. Yeah? Because of the decrease in certain kinds of assets, mainly ecological. Even that low figure is in all likelihood an overestimate Among natural capital assets, we, the team, were able to include only forests, and forests only as sources of timber, but not for the many other ecological services to provide. My God, forests do photosynthesis. (laughs) They weren't able to put in a reckoning for that. They're just looking at the wood. (laughs) Not the biospecies, not the photosynthesis. That's what they had in them. We were... We're not able to, we did carbon in the atmosphere, we did land and subsoil resources, but a great swath of ecosystems and sources of water, which many studies show have degraded in recent years, water tables going down, they didn't have that. We were left unaccounted for in our reckoning because national data were simply not there. So we couldn't put it in a number, they wanted a number, you see we should conclude that wealth per head in India may well have declined in recent decades, reckoned in his way. This is good news. This is the alternative to the GDP reckoning. This is good news, that India is beginning to turn the corner. Next slide. Now, i I've pretty much finished. I'll just throw, put in a few personal reflections. I start with a poem. We need some poetry. Yes. To Mother Earth. I say it's to Mother Earth. You may know the poem. It's called The Rose Family. The rose is a rose and was always a rose. But the theory now goes that the apple's a rose and the pear is and so's the plum, I suppose. The deer only knows what will next prove a rose. You, of course, are a rose. But we're always a rose. Yes. Next. 
1946, there was a poet who had written a similar line of poetry, A Rose is a Rose is a Rose. You may know her, know who she was. Gertrude Stein was her name. And she was about to die just a few minutes later of cancer. And her best friend was sitting next to her, and she asked that friend, what is the answer? And the friend was embarrassed. It was such a banal question and didn't answer. And so her last words were, in that case, what is the question? That's what I've tried to give you. Now, next. The president of my country said in 1992, just at the beginning of the Rio conference about global warming, he said, the American way of life is not subject to negotiation. This is one of the most tragic moments in the history of humankind, in my opinion, because Mother Nature doesn't negotiate. Thank <music> you.